Well, praise the Lord. Good morning. God bless you. Welcome to Victory in the Valley. This is Pastor Kevin Ortiz, and we're so excited. We thank God for you uh, for watching today's program. This, this program is going to change your life. We have recorded this message from Faith Pleases God Church here in Harlingen, Texas. And so we are friends. We are brothers in Christ. We're your neighbors. Amen. And God is doing great things at this church. If you ever have, a t have time, please come on out on Sunday morning at 11 a.m. and come visit me. I know that God has a special blessing for you. You need to come and receive the word of God. You will never be the same again. Amen. In today's message, I know it's going to be a blessing to your life. The anointing of God is upon it. I want you to receive the word of God so that your heart will be open. But understand this, that God will lift up your faith through the word of God. And then things will begin to change because you open up your heart for God to move. Amen. I pray that this, this, this message blesses your life and that things will change in your life. In Jesus' name. Father, I ask that you touch them. I ask that you use this message to have big impact in their life. Bless them in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask you to heal them, protect them, and provide for them, Father God. Thank you, Lord, for stirring up their faith to receive your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Don't change that channel because my father would always say, and I say it as well, it gets gooder and gooder. Thank you for watching today's program of Victory in the Valley. The most amazing thing that, that whenever you go through things in life, God will, will use different characters in the word to minister to you because some of their journey will be your journey. But, but I, I had never studied this guy's life like I have in the last few years. And the more I studied his life and the more I, I got into his life, the more I realized how, how impactful his life actually is. I want to tell you the story of Jacob. It's probably one of the best stories in the Bible, yet very little is said about him or very little is actually preached about his life. It's the story of a guy whose name appears more frequently than you can, you can really think about because anytime I think someone's name appears in, in the word this many times, there has to be something significant as to why their name is mentioned that much. There are seven Bible characters whose names are mentioned over 300 times in the Bible. Who would you think is the number one name mentioned? There's, there's no, well, there will be wrong answers. I can't say there won't be any wrong answers. That would be a lie. But who would you think is, is the number one name mentioned in Scripture? Moses? Jesus, somebody, Abraham, I'm sorry, David, interesting, I love it, all of your answers are wrong. <laughs> Jacob is the most mentioned person in scripture. Number seven is Aaron, number six is Saul. Very interesting, by the way, Saul, number six. <coughs> Judah, number five. Moses, number four. Jesus, number three. Jesus is mentioned 980 times. David, number two. J David is mentioned 1,087 times. The guy that holds the number one position, and, and again, interestingly enough, the count takes a sudden and unprecedented jump from around 1,000 to nearly 3,000, from David's 1,000, now it jumps up to 3,000. Jesus was mentioned 980 times, but this man's name is mentioned 2,930 times. His birth parents gave him the name Jacob. Now, the trick here is that he's actually mentioned with two names because his birth parents gave him the name Jacob, but God gave him another name, Israel. And he's mentioned 2,930 times. 
And so to me, when I think about a guy that's mentioned that often, there has to be something about his life and his story that is incredibly meaningful and pivotal to all of our lives. Now, let me make something very clear. Even though Jacob's name occurs more than three times, that of Jesus, I'm not referring in any way that Jacob is that important. Is that clear? Jesus is the Lord of glory. Okay? But there's a reason that his name is mentioned that much. And so the story of Jacob is, one of the, is just this, one of the most classic examples in the entire Bible on the object of mercy. In our modern day, everyday language here, our English language, Jacob would have, would have come out of a very dysfunctional home, a very dysfunctional family. We all know the story of, of how when he wrestled with God. But there's so many things in that story that impact your life and mine on an everyday level. He tried to control his life. Examples. He tried to control his life, depended on himself and not God. And so God had to break him of this pattern. And one of the greatest lessons that I've ever learned from Jacob's story is that Jacob embodies the shortcomings of all of us who have a, a, a pure heart to pursue God. And so the author of, 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 of Genesis, Moses, actually spends 10 chapters talking about Jacob. Jacob also embodies the kindness and the mercy of God to look past our failures and he sees and, and to see the sincere, the sincerity of our hearts to reach out and then rewards us with his favor the favor of his countenance. In Psalms 36 and verse 5, I had you turn there. And, and let me just say something that, that I, I don't want it to offend you, but, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a hard truth. We don't get anything from God because we prayed the right prayer. We receive from God because his mercy is vast. His mercy is as vast as the universe. If it was dependent on us praying the right prayers, then something would be amiss. Psalms 36 5 says, Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Now turn with me, to, if you will, to Genesis chapter 32, because as I said just a moment ago, Jacob's life embodies the mercy of God. In Genesis 32, we have this biblical account of this encounter that happens at Pinyal, and it begins like this in verse 24 of Genesis 32. It says, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. God arranged for Jacob to be left alone so that he could meet with him. One of the things that I learned in this, in this past season of my life is that loneliness is sometimes a setup for a God-sized encounter. Sometimes God just has to bring you to this place of feeling, feeling where you're like abandoned, totally alone, because he's trying to set something up. In the King James, it, it, in, in the King James Version, the word man in this verse is capitalized. Because most scholars talk about and, and have agreed with the fact that Jacob, when, when Jacob was wrestling, or when this man was wrestling with Jacob on this occasion, 
this man must have been the son of God. It had to be Jesus himself. So now we jump to verse 25. Genesis 32, we're just going to read through to verse 31. Now when, he, now when he, God, saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket, the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And so he said to him, what is your name? Profound that God, God knew what his name was. But there was a reason that he wanted Jacob to say his name. And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Pinyal. For I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Verse 31, just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. But that night, God, who was trying to get through to Jacob, meets with Jacob and he sets him up when he's alone. We saw in verse 24 where it said, Jacob was left alone. It's such a small phrase, but I think it's a very important phrase because what happens is Jacob had run out of his resources. And some of you have just felt like that. You're just, you feel like you are at the end of your rope. You're at the end of all of your ability. And, and here's what happens. When you get to the place where you can no longer do it on your own is when you're going to find God. So Jacob has finally been broken. He's at the end of his rope. His life is a mess. He's all alone. He's exhausted every resource he had. He, and now he has to face Esau alone. And so Jacob is finally broken to the point that now he will trust God. Isn't it sad that sometimes God has to bring us to that place where we're totally broken before we can actually trust him? Because it's very, very easy to become dependent on yourself, on your strengths, on your abilities. And so Jacob was going to spend the next 25 years of his life paying for this decision. And so there's a shocking truth behind all of this because, because he steals a blessing. He steals a birthright. He didn't have to do that, but God had already told him that this is, this is what's going to happen and that they were his, but he has, he's got this plan that he's going to help God out. We all are like that. We're, we're, we're driven this way. When God, you know, when God doesn't move as quickly as we want him to because we, we, we're, called, we're, we're told to wait on the Lord in this, this paradox of waiting because we're so impatient but it's, there, it's, it's those of us that wait on the Lord shall mount up. There's the paradox. When you wait, you actually are mounting up. All right. Oh. It's when you're waiting that you're actually getting ready to soar. But you have to wait. We're driven to, to accomplish and to do. So you can relate to Jacob if you've ever tried to do the right thing the wrong way. He wants to help God out, so he steals his, his birthright. He steals his, his, his blessing, but God had it already planned out this way. And so Jacob was supposed to get his birthright, but, but that wasn't the way that he was supposed to get it. So Jacob spends much of his life trying to get you know, get it for himself, earn it for himself. 
Everything that God wanted to give him as a gift, he's trying to earn. And this is the lesson, I think, for all of us. God doesn't want you to earn it. You can't earn his favor. I hope we can get a chance to talk about that tomorrow. His grace. And so sadly, we spend so much of our lives trying to earn for ourselves what Jesus has already given to us as a gift. You'll see where I'm going in just a moment. So what did God do to Jacob when he wanted to get a hold of Jacob's life? What is God going to do to you or with you or to you to get a hold of your life? He's going to reveal himself. He's going to reveal himself in ways to you that you did not expect. Or he'll allow you to go through something for you to go through it so that you can trust him. Because in the end, it's all about trust. I remember our counselor sitting down with my wife and I. He said something that changed my life. We were, he was asking me about this, the restoration and everything that we were going through. And, and uh, so I told him, and he, he, he made this statement that really revolutionized the way I think about a lot of things. But in particular about this this thing called trust. He said, so when I laid everything out and said, you know, we're going to do this and do this and do that, and, and, and the process says this, and he said, Sam, trust is not earned. And that caught my attention because that's all I've heard. I actually did a, a whole series in our Bible study not too long ago on rebuilding trust. He said, trust is a gift. Trust, like grace, is a gift. He said, now I'm not saying that you shouldn't do the things that are being asked, but what I'm trying to tell you is that at the end of the process, even though you've become trustworthy, people may not trust you. Because it's either a gift they give you, or it's a gift they withhold. That changed my life. And I thought, why am I going to spend years and years and years trying to earn the trust of people who've already chosen never to give it to me? Your circle of friends becomes very small. But I've never been happier and I've never been freer. Trust is a gift. Trust is like grace. And so this, the way that God deals with him is is God wants to reveal himself to to Jacob. And so as as, as soon as we see that Jacob is alone, it says that a man wrestled with him. That man was God. And so we know that that because Jacob is given a new name, now his name is Israel, which means he fights with God. Why does, why does God say to him, why does Jesus say to him, let me go? Because daybreak would have revealed his face to Jacob and Jacob would have not been alive the next day. But Jacob wouldn't let him go, so he says, I won't let you go until you bless me. And so Jacob has finally come to this point where, where he would rather die than live without God's blessings. you got to know this man, his name meant pusher. You'll see this in just a moment. So we notice that Jacob, his name changes from Jacob to Israel when he finally began to trust God. Jacob, or Israel I should say, was, was God's covenant name for the new nation. Jacob represents independence from God. Israel represents dependence on God. Every single one of us needs to encounter God this way. Where we have a wrestling match with God for this reason. 
to encounter him. That God would dismantle all of our ability to, 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 to depend on ourselves to make things happen. Grace means so much more than, than God's unmerited favor. We, we have limited the grace of God when we define it as, as God's unmerited favor. It means so much more than that. But you can't earn it. You just simply receive it. And so a lot of times when we're going through these battles in our life, it's simply because God is trying to get a hold of us and dismantle the patterns that we've become, we've, we've become, we've, we trust the patterns more than we trust God. And so God allows us to go through these seasons in, in our life where, where, where we're, we're alone, where we feel lonely, we feel abandoned. But all of it is for, him, for, is for you to encounter him in a new way. In Psalms 147, turn there please, because this is a fascinating verse. Psalms 147 verse 10 says, He does not delight in the strength of of the horse. He takes no pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his mercy. Psalms 147 verse 10. Please look at this verse. Highlight it. This is important. Why? Because of what it says. He does not delight in the strength of horses or the horse. He takes no pleasure in the legs of a man. Why? Because the legs of a man represent the man's ability to push. And this fascinated me because when I saw this wrestling match or when I read it and, and sort of pictured it, I'm thinking, why in the world, God, out of all the areas that you could have chosen to touch, why didn't you touch his shoulder blade? Why didn't you touch his knee? Why didn't you touch, you know, his back? What was significant that you had to touch his hip socket? Has anybody thought about why that, why that part? We just saw it. He takes no pleasure in the legs of a man. Jacob was a pusher. He pushed his way into everything. And so when Jesus touches his, his, his hip socket, if you want to get a job done, you don't give it to an old guy that can barely muster up any strength. You give it to a young man with strong legs. You give it to a young man who will strap this assignment and he'll position his legs under him and then he'll push his way through completion. God did not take down Jacob's ability to hold on. God took down Jacob's ability to push. He was able to hold on. He took down his ability to push. And as soon as you start pushing your way through life, as soon as you start using your own strength to get your way through, get ready for an encounter with God. Because what his favor can do within, in one moment might take you a lifetime to try to achieve on your own. And so Jacob had to be broken of this pattern that he's always known his entire life. What he didn't know is that this thing had to change, not for his sake, but for the sake of Joseph. This was more than just about Jacob. This was about Jacob's family. 
And to me, I, I think a part of my journey is, is I want to awaken the, the leaders of the church to that this is not about us. This is about our children and our children's children. This is not about with our stage. It's about, it's about the, our spiritual sons and daughters. So if God does not shake up the leadership today, I'm concerned what's going to happen in the next two generations. Are we going to teach our children to push their way through life rather than to encounter God? There's nothing greater that can happen in your life than when you have a wrestling match with God. And all of it is that God wants, wants you to encounter Him so that He can dismantle some of the patterns in your life no matter how they got there. This, and it's not about you. It was only about you until the day you got saved. It's not about you anymore after that. It's about them. God spoke to us and told us that we are supposed to raise up a thousand disciples. The word of God says that we are supposed to go out to, and make disciples of all nations. Have you been discipled? Have you been taught the ways of the Lord? Have you been led by the Holy Ghost? as you have been instructed by someone who's been taught about how to live for God. We have people that want to walk with you. We have people that are great men and women of God that want to pray over your life and that they want to take on the responsibility of seeing you grow in Jesus, in Jesus Christ. Today is the day to sign up. Today is the day to become part of this discipleship program. Become part of this army that we're raising up to serve the Lord. This is a daily discipleship program that you will walk with our spiritual trainers and you will experience the goodness of God. Come by faith, pleases God church, and we will, we will match you up with somebody who will, will encourage you, who will walk with you, who will pray over your life and believe God for the goodness of God for you, for you and your family. You need to become a disciple. Come by faith, pleases God church, or call 956-412-5600 and say, I want to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Thank you guys for watching today's program and thank you for signing up to become a disciple today. It's a free ministry just for you. God bless you and we'll see you in a, in a short while here at church worshiping the Lord with us. God bless you. We love you. God bless. You know, throughout the program, you saw a phone number on the screen that encourages you to, to write or to call. And that, that phone number is our prayer line. Every morning at 6 a.m., you can go to our website, faithpleasesgod.com, faithpleasesgod.com, and I'm there preaching Monday through Friday, live, praying for people, and lifting up the needs of those that have reached out for prayer. We love you guys, and we don't want you guys to suffer, but we want you guys to experience the goodness of God. And you know, as God gives you one miracle, He takes you to another level of His glory. You grow with the Word of God. And not only will God provide for you, but God will use you to change other people's lives. So I want to encourage you guys, call that number and write to us. You can either call or text us your prayer. And then go on to online to faithpleasesgod.com right now. And you'll be able to enjoy a prayer service as we go before God, casting our cares upon the Lord and experience the goodness of God. Thank you for watching today's program. We'll see you next time.